with us today, Johnny Miller. Johnny is the uh, technical lead for strategic biodiversity at the consultancy WSP. Put together the guidebook for us, this blueprint. Do you want to take a few minutes and take us through? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for having me here. Thank you for that um, amazing talk, at Alexandra. And uh, you're right, this natural setting, I think, is really appropriate to the discussion today. The sun is shining, the wind is blowing, um, and it's a beautiful natural setting. So yes, I work for WSP, large consultancy, really privileged to have worked with Euroelectric on this, on this project and with a number of other developers uh, and uh, other stakeholders. And Power Plants 2.0, uh, it's a practical resource for both industry and policymakers to help them accelerate renewable deployment while safeguarding biodiversity. So, and as I think you've set out, it is a much needed resource for us all. And again, just to reiterate some of the, the points that you made, so globally we are faced with these twin and interrelated threats of climate change and biodiversity loss, and the numbers are stark. WWF estimates that climate change has already resulted in over four trillion euros in economic losses to date and a 70% loss of, uh, in wildlife populations since 1970. That is a dramatic change, and that is within the lifetime of many of you in the, in the room here today. So clearly, as you've said, renewables have a pivotal role in combating climate change. And in doing so, renewables can provide a significant benefit to biodiversity. Indeed, a renewables-based energy transition is predicted to result in 75% less risk to biodiversity and ecosystems and 50% less climate-related loss and degradation of land. And that's all when compared to a fossil fuel business as usual. But a tripling of renewables capacity by 2030 uh, requires lots of development projects which are not without risk to land cover and biodiversity. So Power Plant 2 presents a framework for ensuring that transition and these energy projects benefit biodiversity through good design and good implementation. The power sector is already doing much in this area. In developing this guidebook, we interviewed 10 developers, experts and stakeholders, surveyed another 20 Euroelectric members, and we also undertook extensive research of existing literature. And all of this research and uh, engagement identified many ways in which the power sector is already integrating biodiversity within their renewables projects. Our guidebook will showcase 15 of these uh, exemplary case studies from across Europe and across the five focal technologies uh, up on the, on the screen. So our work did highlight a number of common challenges affecting biodiversity integration. Again, uh, some of those have been mentioned uh, already. Conflicts between stakeholders, policy, and land use priorities. Potentially increased costs as a result of uh, this biodiversity premium. For example, from uh, requiring additional land purchases. A lack of common standards and language around biodiversity assessment, limiting assessment efficiencies and the ability to compare, perf compare performance. But it's also highlighted a number of exciting opportunities, including uh, de-risking projects from unforeseen costs and project delays, delivering additional environmental and social benefits from sim uh, beyond simply biodiversity enhancements. And I think that's a really exciting uh, opportunity, trying to increase the efficiency of our land use. And also 
uh, our renewable projects and all the research that goes into uh, developing them provides a, a really important source of data and knowledge that can help industry in general uh, and, uh, and the environment to improve performance. And many of these challenges and opportunities were raised uh, last night over dinner uh, with a number of the people I spoke to. Um, so it's great to uh, have that validation. So on the back of this work and through a number of targeted workshops with Euroelectric uh, and their key stakeholders, our guidebook sets out a first of a kind uh, set of guiding principles for biodiversity integration that addresses these challenges and realizes uh, many of these benefits. Mm. The guidebook and its principles are based on a range of existing international resources and developer approaches and were developed <coughs> to be applied throughout the project lifecycle. From uh, right at the beginning, uh, citing new developments, selecting those sites uh, and assessing their feasibility, through the design and permitting process, through construction, operation, all the way to decommissioning. So the guidebook sets out a number of principles, and uh, one of these is fundamental, and that is the uh, mitigation hierarchy and really should be applied to all projects. The mitigation hierarchy is a tool for limiting biodiversity loss and achieving the best possible outcomes for biodiversity. It comprises four steps that can be followed, uh, that should be followed in order and to the fullest extent possible before moving to the next step. And this process is nicely illustrated, I think, by this graph. So at the start of the process, we have a negative predicted biodiversity impact depicted by this large green bar. The initial size of this bar um, de uh, describes the extent of possible impact. So a site of higher biodiversity value uh, uh, currently on its site will have a greater potential for adverse impacts and therefore a larger bar. The first step then is to avoid impacts as far as possible. And that is through uh, sensitive site selection, but also citing uh, the development activities sensitively within the development site. The next step is to minimize adverse impacts, for example, by scheduling the timing of development activities. And then where impacts cannot be prevented, we have uh, restoring or re-establishing what was lost or degraded as, as a result of the project. And then finally, uh, offsetting any residual impacts um, to achieve uh, either on or off-site to achieve um, positive outcomes. The extent to which each of these steps can be applied and therefore the outcomes achieved will depend on a number of factors which are summarized here. But by using metrics, we can measure change and demonstrate measurable outcomes. <coughs> so as I said, we've got a number of pr principles, 12 principles, and we've, we can broadly group them together in three, uh, three groups. The first of these relates very closely to the mitigation hierarchy and sets out a sequential process of measuring change. It highlights, however, the importance of irreplaceable biodiversity, so those features that cannot be easily or at all recreated. The second group of principles uh, identifies the right biodiversity measures to be implemented for a particular project, taking account of the existing site characteristics and uh, local conservation pr priorities. So identifying additional biodiversity gains uh, informed by stakeholder uh, engagement and risk management. And then finally, the third group um, relates to information flows and long-term benefits. So these principles ensure that uh, projects transparently inform uh, and are informed by stakeholder engagement uh, and uh, industry best practice. All principles should be considered uh, at all stages of the project lifecycle um, and project proponents should evidence how they've been applied or justified where it's not been possible. 
and together these represent best practice, um, a, a best practice approach to um, biodiversity integration. And, and we know that applying these principles can pay off. Um, and here's a great example of how applying the mitigation hierarchy can help to reduce potential losses and increase gains. You'll have seen this slide before, um, but imagine that is a, the, the top uh, graph is a higher baseline value site, biodiversity value site, with a larger initial green bar, so a larger potential uh, capacity for loss, versus a lower baseline site with a lower potential capacity for loss. So just locating our sites um, sensitively can reduce potential biodiversity loss and therefore um, uh, biodiversity impacts. And whilst, as I said before, the, um, the, the process and uh, potential for applying those different, um, uh, those different mitigation steps will vary depending on sites, if we apply the same uh, offset, um, amount of offset to two different sites with two different baselines, then we can achieve um, measurably different, uh, different outcomes when we choose sites selectively and sensitively. In the guidebook, we set out practical actions for implementation um, at each of the project lifecycle stages. Um, today, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Um, and here we can see at the design and permitting stage, a project, um, a solar, farm, solar farm development that is designed through engagement with local stakeholders and uh, through undertaking appropriate surveys and research identifies key features uh, to support those local populations, and those can then be, uh, uh, the site can then be arranged to, uh, to maintain those, those features and functions, but also there's an opportunity there for achieving multiple benefits, so designing the site for those, uh, those features to provide visual screening or flood storage or other uh, functions. And then here at the operational phase, we've got a hydropower project um, the project could be implementing long-term uh, measures to support fish migration. Uh, at the same time, the operator continue, can continue to monitor performance over, over time, transparently report on the outcomes, uh, adapt measures where necessary, and share data and insights with industry so that we can all improve and learn from it. So that's what we've got within the Power Plant 2 uh, project that, um, report that will be coming out soon. And this is just a taster. Through this process, we identified uh, a number of uh, addi additional questions that industry and, um, uh, and regulators can work together to resolve. So here we have uh, a number of them there. So how to, how to finance this biodiversity premium, how to harmonize methodologies, and how to report most effectively. And finally, I want to invite you to the launch event uh, of Power Plant 2.0. Um, it's going to be uh, launched 13th of June in Brussels. You can scan the QR code to register, and I look forward to meeting some of you there. Thank you. Donnie, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.